We are back on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio News Talk, 1180, 1230, KGEO, 1410, KERI, 1000 KKIM in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and three times a week across this great nation on KNUCMedia.com. Our guest by phone, Dr. Ivan Eland, who wrote a great book called Recarving Rushmore. So, question for you. I, I thought this was interesting. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was rated number 29, and... I was, and you kind of gave me a segue here when you made the comment, you know, a man is made by his times, and, and you're rating the presidents on peace, prosperity, and liberty. How could someone like Lincoln really do well because he was put into a situation where, um, I, I think you said he provoked the Civil War in your book, but, you know, the only way he could be higher up in the ratings was not to have a Civil War and allow us to have two separate nations. Well, I don't think it necessarily would have to come to that because uh, he was when he after he got elected, but before he took office, he was adamant to not negotiating with the South on uh, the expansion of slavery, and um, you know that we kind of in our lens today we we say, well, you know, he's sticking up for principle and, and that sort of thing, but really, Abraham Lincoln was a politico. Yes, he believed that he won the election, and therefore. There was no compromise because that was the Republican Party. And the Republican Party didn't really have altruistic uh, tendencies. They were the party of the white worker. And, of course, uh, you know, there's a little, if you, uh, if you uh, expand uh, slavery into the West, that's competition for uh, white workers. So, and, uh, you know, cheap labor, um, you know, free labor, actually. So, so this was, uh, and, and, of course, he won the election, uh, you know, with less than 40 percent of the vote, simply because there were four candidates. Four candidates, the yeah. The, the reason for the uh, Civil War was that the Democratic Party, which was the dominant party at the time, the only true national party, split into two wings, the North and the South. And, you know, so the expansion of slavery was the issue. But, but uh, he had originally called for... Uh, compensated emancipation, and almost all country, uh, major countries in the world that had slavery uh, were able to uh, free the slaves by compensated emanu- emancipation. We're the only major country that had a civil war, and it was a titanic civil war, uh, you know, killing probably, they've just re- upped the casualties 20%, so it's probably killed uh, about 800,000 people, which at the, at the time, it's still our largest war, and of course, it killed civilians as well as uh, military people. And uh, the problem was that the slaves were only free to name. As Martin Luther King, I think, rightly said, <clears throat> you know, the slaves weren't really freed until the 1960s with the Civil Rights Movement. And I think the Civil War <clears throat> did more to uh, uh, impede black progress than any other thing. The, the, the South was mad after the war. They led to the KKK. They were mad that there were Union troops uh, enforcing uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. <clears throat> and, of course, this led to a backlash, and we got the Jim Crow laws. We got the Black Codes where the slaves had to work for the, their, the same masters they had before. Now they were, they were technically free, but they were paid. They were um, they had paid only a small amount. Sometimes they were uh, d- dragooned into new, the neo-slavery, uh, which is getting more publicity now among historians by... Uh, the fact that Trump uh, charges were trumped up on them like vagrancy or whatever, and then they had to work them off, and the state sent them to various companies to work to work uh, as basically slave labor. So uh, whether the you know the, this really halted racial progress, and I think uh, you know the the slavery was had already gone from the north because of industrialization, and it was going away from the border states because those were the most industrialized in the south. And so we could, you know, if nothing happened, uh, you could see the slavery would eventually go out simply because industrialization, uh, it doesn't pay to have slave labor because slave la- slaves don't work very well because they don't make any money and, uh, and whatnot. So, well, so uh, it has nothing to do with race at all. If you pay people in an industrial setting, they'll you know, they'll be a lot more productive. Uh, it's fine for agricultural sort of work where, you know, where you're out there, uh, uh, you know, you're housing the people, et cetera. But in an urban setting, they don't get housing or anything else. So, you know, they'll, they'll revolt 
in an urban setting if you don't uh, pay them and pay them reasonably well. Sure. You know, and, and it's interesting looking at Lincoln and, and Kennedy. It'd be interesting to see what their ratings would be had they both lived because, you know, as you as you mentioned, Kennedy's policies weren't the greatest. The only reason a lot of his policies went through is because of Johnson and because of Kennedy's memory. And Lincoln, if he lived, would have had to face Reconstruction, and that would have uh, totally changed his image because, you know, he would have had to face a hostile uh, Republican Party. So, you know, who knows what their ratings would have been. Right, right. And, of course, you know, we always uh, congratulate the the winner of the war, and <clears throat> we congratulate uh, Lincoln for saving the Union. But, of course, he could have saved the Union uh, by either eman- emancipating the slaves, uh, by, co- by compensating their owners, or perhaps uh, reaching a compromise. You know, uh, a lot of people wanted to go back to the Missouri Compromise of 1820 or some variant of that because that had held the country together. We had slavery north, uh, slavery, no slavery north of that line, uh, and uh, slavery south of the line. But but uh, the problem was all the parties of the Civil War thought it was going to end quickly. And when you have a, a conflict that ma- yeah, of huge magnitude that scorches the earth, especially in the South uh, with Sherman's march to the sea and Sheridan's, uh, you know, scorched earth policy in the Shenandoah, you know, people don't forget that. And, uh, you know, you may disagree with their social uh, views. And, of course, you know, I think we learned also in the Vietnam War that when you try to impose your culture on other people that don't like it, uh, even if you think your culture is better, uh, it doesn't really work out very well. And um, the same is true with the North and the South. I mean, it was a similar um, uh, 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 event. In fact, there's a General Bunting wrote a book that compared the Vietnam War to uh, the Reconstruction in the South, and he said exactly that. He said, you know, it's very difficult to impose by military power on foreign cultures. And, of course, the South was a foreign culture to the North because it uh, it had slavery in the North, didn't it? Yeah, totally different culture. We're having a conversation with Dr. Uh, Ivan Eland from the Independent Institute, author of Recarving Rushmore. Doctor, do you think, based on uh, some of the recent executive orders and some of the things that Obama has done, that his ranking would change drastically? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I was on Fox and Friends uh, a couple weeks ago, and I said that uh, um, Donald Trump came on later and said that my book had no credibility because it didn't rate Obama as the worst president. And I said, and that owner, the um, the anchor. Uh, stuck up for me because I obviously was go- gone off the set. He said, "Well, he did say Obama's dropping like a rock." And yes, I have in my book. I have an asterisk. I don't rate Do- Obama very high, and I think he's plummeting uh, because of the the executive order on immigration and also because of the uh, war in ISIS. He, he's got his strategy is muddled, and he, he's getting in there, but he's sort of putting one toe in. And I think either stay out or you know you have to fight to win it. So so I think that's a drawback, too. So I think he, he the asterisk says, you know, I rated him after five years uh, was when I was writing the book. And, uh, you know, so his, his rating could drop uh, some more. And uh, he's certainly not doing better. Uh, and yeah, but the problem with the uh, presidents is they usually have really bad second terms. The Congress starts stops cooperating with them, and I think we're going to see that even more with the Republicans taking over. So then they turn from domestic to foreign policy, and usually, unfortunately, they get into mischief uh, in foreign policy, uh, and I think uh, we may see that with uh, Obama. Well, I'm certainly glad you brought up the Fox and Friends interview. I didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good interview. But the, the other issue I wanted to mention was... Um, you talk about culture and people taking over or directing culture. Don't you think ISIS is doing that, trying to do that with the American people? Well, I think, you know, uh, ISIS is a regional threat right now. I mean, al-Qaeda has more bomb-making capability and more networks in the West. And so I think, you know, it would be probably better to let Turkey handle this, but and th- that these countries will never handle if we go in and race in. Certainly, ISIS, I think the solution there is frankly, to recognize that Iraq is partitioned. I wrote a book a few years ago saying, you know, we should just partition Iraq because uh, it's really three countries. It's never really been a 
a country that uh, it's sort of an artificial country that's been held together by dictators, including the last one, Saddam Hussein. And I think what the solution to the problem is letting the Sunnis rule themselves because what they fear ISIS more than they fear. Uh, this, uh, I mean, the less that they fear ISIS, less than they fear the Shiite government. So, if you took away the Shiite, got a strong central government, then the groups wouldn't fight over it as much because it, w- it didn't have the possibility to oppress them. If you remove that oppression, then the Sunni tribes will do what they did with the precursor group Al Qaeda in Iraq, which is uh, which is morphed into ISIS. They threw out that group. Uh, because it got too brutal. And ISIS will get too brutal and already is more brutal than uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, if you can believe that. And I think the Sunni tribes, if they, if they didn't fear the Shiite government, they would definitely have a, an, an incentive to kick them out again, as they did before. I think that's probably one of the solutions. The second solution is, you know, let Turkey deal with it. They made this problem. Uh, we, you know, we don't have the money to do these things anymore. And uh, I think sometimes we just direct this group uh, against us. Uh, when we started bombing, they started beheading people and. You know, that's all for show, yeah. and it created a, a real Dr. Elin, uh, I got, stir I, in this country. But our own allies, the Saudis, behead, have beheaded more people than ISIS. So I think yeah. we have to keep – ISIS is certainly not a, a nice group. Uh, they're really awful. <laughs> but gotta, we, have gotta, to, we have to distinguish threats that are threats to the United States and Kim, threats gotta, to I would have to, have to cut you off at that. Dr. Elin, we've got to have you come back. Uh, the name of the book is Recarving Rushmore, Ranking the Presidents on Peace, Prosperity, and Liberty. We will see you in 167 hours on Taking Care of Business on Current Radio. News Talk 1180.